Hi everyone and welcome back to the Shakespeare and Veronaville series where we look at the links between the Sims of Veronaville and the Shakespeare plays that inspired them. This time around we are looking at the two gentlemen of Verona which I'm going to refer to as two gents for the rest of the video because it's a long name and I'm lazy. Two Gents is a comedy that was written by Shakespeare at some point between 1589 and 1593. If you've watched the previous episode on Twelfth Night, you'll notice some obvious similarities in the themes and the plots of the two plays. And as with Twelfth Night, we're very much staying in the Monty family with this one. We'll get to see Valentine, Sylvia, Proteus, Julia, Lucetta, Thurio, and a little bit of Antonio. I couldn't find a freely available full modernized version of Shakespeare's original play, so I went to a website called Lit Charts and I got a subscription there because they have modern English translations of all of Shakespeare's plays side by side with the original texts and footnotes that clarify period specific details and all that, which I find pretty useful. Uh, I'm not getting paid by them to tell you this, but just for the sake of transparency, that's where I'm getting my text from now on. So all the quotes in this episode are from a modern English translation that was made by Nina Romanchikova. The details are in the description. As for the performance of the play that I watched, it's a 2018 performance at the Hofstra Shakespeare Festival. It was directed by Ilona Pierce, or Ilona Pierce, I'm sorry. The link to it is in the description as well. The play starts in Verona, an Italian city that actually exists and existed in Shakespeare's time as well. Verona is also the backdrop of Romeo and Juliet, and as the name suggests, it was the inspiration for Veronaville. The two gentlemen of Verona are Valentine and Proteus, who are close friends. Valentine is about to leave Verona and travel to Milan to acquire some life experience. When saying goodbye to Proteus, Valentine pokes fun at his friend because instead of traveling and seeing the world outside, Proteus would rather stay home in Verona so that he can be near Lady Julia, whom he's in love with. Valentine thinks that being in love is very silly and that Proteus is a fool for passing up a good opportunity. And so Valentine goes to Milan while Proteus stays in Verona. Julia, Proteus's beloved, is a pretty fun character. Well, at least that's how I see her, especially after watching the play performed at the Hofstra Shakespeare Festival. The actress that plays Julia in that rendition is a lot of fun. So the first time we see Julia, she's with her maid Lucetta and they talk about Proteus. They both agree that he's a very fine man and it's very obvious that Julia is absolutely in love with him. She's all weird about it though, like she doesn't want to admit it out loud to Lucetta and so she pretends that she doesn't care. But Lucetta sees through her act and she teases her with a love letter that Proteus asks her to give to Julia. And it's pretty funny, Julia's like, no, I really don't care what's in that letter. And she gets angry with Lucetta to the point that she takes the letter from her and tears it into pieces without reading it. But then, as soon as Lucetta is gone, she scrambles to pick up the pieces to try and read what's on them. And she kisses them and basically calls herself a dumbass for acting so inconsistently. Then Proteus's father, Antonio, decides that Proteus should go join Valentine in Milan because traveling is good for you when you're young and you need to see the world outside and all that. And Proteus doesn't really want to go because he wants to stay with Julia, but Antonio doesn't really give him a choice and basically forces him to embark on a ship the next day. I'm not exactly sure why he needs to travel by ship to go from Verona to Milan, but I don't think Shakespeare cared about real-world geography. Proteus has to say goodbye to Julia, who is heartbroken, but they both promise to stay faithful to each other. Promise. That's foreshadowing. In Milan, Valentine is doing well at the court of the Duke of Milan, and wait for it, he's fallen madly in love with the Duke's daughter, Sylvia. Which of course is ironic, given how much he laughed at Proteus for being in love. Uh, Sylvia loves him back too, but the problem is that the Duke wants her to marry Thurio, another gentleman that Sylvia hates. Thurio is painted as a talentless idiot, not as bad as Sir Andrew in Twelfth Night, but still, he's supposed to be a character that the audience laughs at. And he knows that Sylvia hates him too. The Duke knows, everyone knows that Sylvia does not want to marry Thurio, but still, the Duke insists that she does. And since Valentine knows that, he tries to court Sylvia in secret to stay in the Duke's good graces. So that's the point we're at when Proteus arrives in Milan and is introduced to the Duke's court as well. Valentine is super happy to see his friend and he introduces him to Sylvia, who welcomes him warmly because she's heard many times from Valentine that Proteus is a great guy and so she trusts him. Then when they're alone, Valentine explains his situation to Proteus. 
he says that after he made fun of love earlier, love, Cupid really, is taking his revenge on him and he now loves Sylvia more than anything and they're even secretly engaged. Then he tells him that the Duke wants her to marry Thurio, and that since the Duke knows that she hates Thurio, he locks her up every evening at the top of a very high tower so she can't escape during the night. Which is of course completely normal, that behavior. But Valentine has a plan to go and free Sylvia that night so they can elope together, and he tells Proteus about it. But then, as soon as Valentine leaves, we learn that Proteus also just fell in love with Sylvia right then, a second ago when he was introduced to her. And so he has a monologue where he basically decides to free himself from all the promises of fidelity that he made to Julia and to now pursue Sylvia instead. Even though Valentine literally just told him that he and Julia were engaged. So in order to prevent Sylvia from getting away with Valentine, Proteus goes right to the Duke to let him know of Valentine's plan to escape with her. The Duke gets angry, he intercepts Valentine and he banishes him from Milan. Then we have a glorious scene where a very distraught Valentine laments to Proteus over his misfortune, not knowing that Proteus is the one who's responsible for it. And Proteus fakes being a supportive friend. He tells them that it's gonna be fine, even if Valentine is banished from Milan, he can at least write letters to Sylvia from his exile and address them to him, Proteus, so he can deliver them directly to Sylvia like the good friend he is. Once Valentine is gone, the Duke is still worried that just because Sylvia can't see him anymore, it doesn't mean that she's gonna fall in love with Furio now, quite the opposite. So Proteus suggests that someone should go talk to Sylvia and basically debase Valentine to her while praising Furio so that she changes her mind about both of them. As you can tell, they don't have much faith in her intelligence. And since the best person to talk shit about Valentine convincingly would be a friend of his, Proteus would be the best person to do it, right? Yeah, Proteus would definitely be the best person to spend some time alone with Sylvia with the Duke's blessing, obviously. In the meantime, in Verona, Julia misses Proteus so much that she asks Lucetta to help her disguise herself as a page boy so she can travel to Milan and be with him. Lucetta helps her, but she worries that Proteus might not be as happy to see Julia as Julia will be to see him. And as we already know, she's not wrong, to say the least. Julia is like, oh, I'm not worried at all. Like, he said he would always be faithful to me, so I have no reason not to trust him. And Lucetta has doubts. Uh, maybe she's been wronged by a man in the past, who knows? But she's much more cold-headed about the situation than Julia is. Which makes sense with the theme of the play. Julia is blinded by love. Love is blind is a sentiment that comes back again and again all throughout. So Julia disguises herself as a page named Sebastian, a name that you might remember from last time, and she goes to Milan. Once she arrives at night, she sees Proteus talking to Sylvia at the window of her tower, trying to seduce her. Julia is in absolute shock, but she doesn't come out of hiding and keeps looking on. And she sees that Sylvia is firmly refusing Proteus' advances and calling him names for trying to seduce her when he knows that she's engaged to his friend Valentine, and Sylvia knows that Proteus is already in a relationship too with Julia. And when Sylvia confronts him about that, he tries to pretend that Julia is dead, which Sylvia doesn't buy, but all the while Julia is still watching from a distance. In the morning, Sylvia talks to Sir Eglemore, and she asks him to help her escape from Milan so she can rejoin Valentine in Mantua. And Iglemore, as the fine gentleman he is, accepts to help her and promises to come get her in the evening. In the forest outside Milan, Valentine has run into a band of outlaws who threatened to steal his stuff, and when they ask him why he was banished, he lies to them, telling them that he killed a man in a fair fight, hoping to impress them so they back down. The outlaws are quite impressed, but instead of leaving him alone, they give him a choice. Become our leader or we'll kill you. So he accepts to become their leader. Probably more because he's scared shitless than because he really wants to, but hey ho. Back in Milan, Julia, still disguised as Sebastian, has become Proteus's page boy and he uses her as a love messenger to Sylvia. Which is pretty horrible for Julia, of course. Um, Proteus, not knowing that his page boy is in fact Julia, uh, asks her to give Sylvia a ring as a token of his love. A ring that Julia herself had given to him right before he left Verona as a symbol of her fidelity to him. 
And of course, Julia, as she receives her ring back, can barely hide her emotion, but she somehow keeps up the act and even says afterwards in a monologue that she's still in love with Proteus after everything she's seen. So Julia goes to Sylvia as Proteus's page to do what she was asked, and she gets the chance to really bond with Sylvia there, because Sylvia is unwavering in condemning Proteus's behavior, and she says that she pities Julia very much, not knowing that Julia is in fact the page boy who's right in front of her. It's a very touching scene between these two. Julia, the page boy, pretends that she knows, well, Lady Julia very well, and through that device she's able to talk about her own feelings in the third person, and Sylvia shows real sympathy. And it's a moving scene, it's the second half of Act 4, Scene 4, if you want to read it for yourself. That night, Sylvia escapes from her tower with Sir Eglamory, but then she's captured by the band of outlaws that Valentine ran into earlier. They say that they're going to take her to their leader, and it's like, great, take her to Valentine, that's fantastic. But before they can, Proteus shows up with Julia still disguised as his page, and he rescues her from the outlaws. So at this point, the outlaws are gone, and Sylvia is alone in the woods with Proteus, who's still trying very hard to seduce her. Luckily, Valentine happens to be nearby, and he sees their whole exchange from behind the trees. When Proteus gets more explicit about forcing himself onto Sylvia, Valentine intervenes and yells at Proteus. Immediately after follows the clownish-esque turn of events I have ever read in a play, and I swear I'm not cutting anything out. There's a lot to unpack here. So what happens here is Valentine catches his best friend trying to rape his fiance. He understandably gets angry and calls him out, and then Proteus has a few lines asking for forgiveness, and Valentine just forgives him on the spot. And on top of that, he offers him to have Sylvia. Sylvia doesn't have a single speaking line during or after that exchange until the curtain falls, by the way. As Valentine offers Sylvia to Proteus, like she's has to offer like some fucking object, Julia, the page boy who remembers, saw absolutely everything, faints from the emotion. Uh, once the attention has shifted to her, she takes off her disguise and reveals her identity, upon which Proteus has some sort of mini revelation, and Valentine takes their hands and reunites them, and apparently Julia is happy to be with Proteus again. Sure. At that point, the outlaws come back with Sir Thurio and the Duke that they've presumably taken captive, heavens know how. And upon seeing Sylvia with Valentine, Thurio is like, she's mine! And Valentine threatens him with violence if he gets close to her, and Thurio backs down immediately because he's a coward and he knows fully well that Sylvia doesn't love him anyway. Thank you, Thurio, for being one of the rare characters of this play with some semblance of sense. After witnessing such a display of bravery on Valentine's part, the Duke decides all of a sudden that Valentine deserved to marry Sylvia, and that Thurio is an idiot. And so the play ends. Sylvia and Valentine get married with the Duke's blessing. Julia and Proteus get married as well on the same day. And everyone is merry and married. Valentine starts off making fun of the silly things that love makes people do. And then he falls in love himself and starts doing silly things too. He definitely knows how to lie, we see him lie to the Duke to hide his intentions towards Sylvia, 
and he lies to the allies to make himself appear more threatening to them, but he's never deceitful to the people he loves, namely Selvian and Proteus, which is good, but you know, if anything, he's actually maybe a bit too quick to forgive Proteus for his deception. And what the hell is the part where he tells Proteus that he can have Sylvia? I thought Valentine was supposed to love Sylvia. Uh, let's be honest, that part is there either precisely because it's outrageous for comedic effect and or because Julia needed to have a reason to faint and reveal her true identity. In The Sims 2, Valentine is a Roman sim. I feel like that could match Shakespeare's Valentine if by Roman sim Max is meant a one true love type of Roman sim, but as we know that's not what the romance aspiration is in The Sims 2. Although to be fair, again, Valentine seemed pretty enthusiastic about letting Proteus have Sylvia, so maybe his love wasn't that deep or just not that exclusive, which are two different things. Um, I think that could be taken in any of several directions for Sims 2 Valentine if you're looking to give him a proper backstory. Because he's a base game deceased ancestor with missing data, Sims 2 Valentine has a blank personality. If you wanted to choose a personality for him matching Shakespeare's Valentine's personality, I would give him a good number of points in nice. Then his eagerness to travel outside his hometown can be interpreted as him being outgoing and active. In The Sims 2, as in two gents, Valentine is married to Sylvia, so that definitely matches. In the play, Sylvia is presented as a pretty righteous woman who stays constant in her love for Valentine and in her disdain for Thurio and Proteus. In Act 3, Scene 1, the Duke, her father, talks to Valentine about how he can seem to make her accept Thurio as her husband. So yeah, Sylvia definitely knows what she wants, and she's not afraid to stand up against her father's authority. Her very firm rebuttals to Proteus's advances also show that she hates treachery. She has in common with the character of Olivia in Twelfth Night that she's basically immune to flattery. I think she comes off as a very strong woman. The production of the play that I watched had Sylvia be exceptionally strong physically. This is shown not in her appearance, the actress playing her doesn't look particularly muscular or anything, but it's established through acting in one specific instance. It's in the scene where Julia, disguised as Proteus's page boy, comes to Sylvia on Proteus's behalf and ends up bonding with her. The initial reason why she was sent by Proteus is to receive a painting of Sylvia that Sylvia said Proteus could have. Just to clarify, she didn't intend it as an encouragement for Proteus to keep pursuing her. It's kind of a backhanded gift. When Proteus asks her for the painting initially, she says, So when Julia comes to Sylvia for the painting in the morning, Sylvia asks her servant to bring the painting, and it's a pretty large, thick-framed painting. You can clearly tell from the way the servant is carrying it that it must be very heavy. But when Sylvia takes it, she appears to have no difficulty carrying it at all. And when she hands it over to Julia, Julia is very surprised by how heavy it really is. She struggles as much as the servant did, and she can barely lift it off the ground. That was not in the original text, because Shakespeare gives very few stage directions. It's really the stage director and the actor's job to add their touch. But just from that little sequence, we get the impression that Sylvia has impressive physical strength. And then, when you see the scene at the end of the play when Proteus, the weakling, is threatening to assault her, you know that he's probably not ever going to get anywhere with that, because she beats him one-on-one -on -one every time. I think that decision made by the stage director or whoever was meant to help with the tone issue of that scene. We're in a comedy, a fairly straightforward one by Shakespeare standards, and suddenly there's the threat of sexual assault. That's rough. It clashes, for modern audiences at least. So if you choose to establish that Sylvia actually has the upper hand and therefore Proteus's threat is pretty silly considering he's in no position to be making it, it softens the clash. It alleviates the tone discrepancy, and it makes it much less uncomfortable and weird to watch. And having Sylvia being stronger physically and otherwise than Proteus isn't a stretch from the original text. For instance, look at how Shakespeare had Sylvia and Proteus interact with their respective fathers. 
At the start of the play, Proteus's father Antonio pretty much orders Proteus to leave Verona and go to Milan, and Proteus doesn't want to, but he submits rather quickly. In contrast, Sylvia is resistant to her father's authority. He wants her to marry a man that she doesn't want, and so she refuses, and in the end her persistence pays off and she gets her way. Her father submits to her decision to marry Valentine. Sylvia is in control of her life, and Proteus seems weak in comparison, especially when you consider that he's a man and she's a woman, and so by the logic of that period, it's expected that she should be submissive and he should be in control. But here the roles are reversed. Following that logic, the production of the play that I was talking about made a few other decisions that gave agency to Sylvia and also further help with softening the ending of the play. Notably, as I said in Shakespeare's text, Sylvia doesn't get any speaking line after she says, oh heaven, when Proteus is threatening her. But that production changed that by giving her lines that were initially meant to be said by Valentine. In Shakespeare's text, after Julia reveals her true identity and Proteus um, acknowledges his wrongdoing, I guess. Valentine takes their hands, reunites them, and they magically are the perfect couple again, apparently. In the performance, it's Sylvia that takes Valentine and Proteus's hands and reunites them as friends. Which makes more sense, in my humble opinion, because Sylvia is the person at the center of the dispute between Valentine and Proteus, and so it makes sense that she would have a word to say about it and sort of give her blessing for Valentine and Proteus' continued friendship instead of them ignoring her completely. So yeah, I really like this take on the character of Sylvia, and I know this is just one of several possible interpretations of her character, but to me at least that's one that makes sense and that I like to imagine fits Sims to Sylvia. In the game, Sylvia is a knowledge sim. Nothing in Two Gents shows Shakespeare's Sylvia as being particularly driven by knowledge, but nothing goes against that either. If not a knowledge sim, Sylvia could maybe be a family sim, in the sense that she's quite exclusive in her love for Valentine and her intent on getting married to him. Sims 2 Sylvia is a base game diseased ancestor with a blank personality. You could argue that 2 Gen Sylvia is rather serious, and I would say that's her main trait. Uh, she seems fairly balanced otherwise. Obviously, Sims 2 personality bars are not the most comprehensive way to translate someone's actual personality. Um, they're not nearly specific or nuanced enough to be realistic, but you know, that's what we've got. As for her physical appearance, we actually have some indications of what Sylvia looks like from Julia's monologue when she's looking at Sylvia's painting and comparing herself to her physically. Sylvia is described as having auburn hair, a low forehead, and grey eyes. Seems to Sylvia does not match this description at all. She has black hair and brown eyes, but to be honest, I wouldn't have expected Maxis to go that deep into Shakespeare's text anyway. From the start to the end, Julia is pretty much at the mercy of her love for Proteus. Whatever she sees or hears him do, she stays dedicated to him. Everyone can have their own opinion on whether that's admirable or not, but you know, either way, that's a major trait she shows. At least it's clear that she's self-aware, she realizes that being in love makes her do silly things, and she's not really happy about her own behavior, like when she gets angry at Lucetta over Proteus's love letter, and then she regrets it and calls herself an idiot. But she can't help it, and I think that she's quite relatable, actually. <laughs> I find it difficult to really judge her. The physical description she gives of herself in that scene with Sylvia's portrait lets us know that she has blonde hair, a high forehead, and the same grey eyes as Sylvia. In The Sims 2, Julia did have blonde hair before it turned grey according to her Sim DNA, and she has grey eyes too. As to her forehead, well, you know, the base game hairstyles pretty much all give the same forehead length, but in her case, you can't even see her forehead anyway since she's wearing a straw hat. You can imagine that she has a high forehead underneath that. In The Sims 2, Julia is a family sim, which does correspond. Even though Julia never mentions having children, um, nobody ever does, the focus is really on whether the couples are going to be together in the end or not. Uh, she's married to Proteus, which is in alignment with the play, and they both have the last name Pantalone. Pantalone is a character in the Commedia dell'arte, the comedic theatrical genre from Italy that also originated Harlequin, which we talked about last time. Pantalone is the archetype of the avaricious Venetian merchant. Besides his extreme stinginess, he also tends to get flirty with young women who are nothing like him and who make fun of him openly, and those are really his two main traits. As you can tell, none of that can really be found in either Julia or Proteus, so as far as I can tell, Maxis gave them that specific name kind of arbitrarily. 
I guess it's just a reference to the Commedia dell'arte among many that can be found across the Monti family tree. Proteus is the false friend that puts love before everything else but then is quick to let one woman down when he sets his sights on another. When you think about it, he's as much a victim of love as Julia is, just in a different way. Almost as soon as he meets Sylvia, he completely casts aside his attachments to Julia and Valentine, both of whom he was very close to, and he becomes this scheming little devil that just tramples everything on his way to get to his goal. Remember the theme of the play, love makes you blind and takes command over you. And when I say love, I mean love with a capital L, meaning Cupid, the ancient Roman god of love, who is mentioned explicitly in the play. A modern reading of the play would tend to hold Proteus and the other characters accountable for their actions, but in Shakespeare's time, the characters are understood to be Cupid's puppets, at least to an extent. It's a conception of human lives that can be traced back to classical Greece, the notion of fate, predetermination, people not being fully in control of their lives, gods ultimately having people's destinies in their hands, you know, a bit like we have control over our sins. In The Sims 2, Proteus is a knowledge sim, which does not match the aspiration of Shakespeare's Proteus. In the beginning of the play, Proteus says explicitly that he's been neglecting his studies because of his love for Julia. His quest for love is stronger than everything else, and his aspiration is quite clearly romance. As for his personality, I want to say that he appears quite playful and outgoing. He's also not grouchy. Take this with a grain of salt because honestly, his personality seems to have been mostly overridden by the fact that Cupid possesses him, basically, so the true him, if there's even such a thing, might actually be quite different, but that's for you to imagine. This time around, Antonio is even more of a secondary character than in Twelfth Night. He only appears in one scene, Act 1, Scene 3. It's the scene where he makes the decision to send Proteus, his son, to Milan after Valentine so he too can get some life experience away from home. He's very adamant in his decision and when Proteus pleads to at least delay his departure a bit, he's completely inflexible, like no, you go tomorrow, that's final. Maybe he means well, but he seems to be completely unconcerned with his son's feelings. He doesn't know or care to know why Proteus is reluctant to leave Verona. He doesn't know of the relationship that Proteus has with Julia, because Proteus is too much of a coward to tell him about it. Proteus is quite scared of his father's disapproval, evidently, and that explains why he gives in and sets off to Milan so quickly, I guess. Antonio is not a likable character in this play, and since we see so little of him, there's no redeeming quality of him that we're shown that we could hang on to. Uh, maybe it's just me really disliking tyrannical parenting, but here you go. They say being too harsh on your kids only teaches them to lie and cheat, because that's the only way they have to satisfy you. Well, look how Proteus turned out. <laughs> Treacherous scum. I doubt that's the kind of parenting seems to Antonio's biography is referring to when it says that he's committed to his children. Lucetta, Julia's handmaid, is a secondary character as well, but we still see enough of her that we get some indication of what she's like. From the scene where she teases Julia with Proteus's love letter, we can tell that she's quite playful and, well, maybe not particularly nice, but that doesn't necessarily make her grouchy either. She protests when Julia starts yelling at her, which shows that she isn't shy or submissive. In the scene where Julia plans to disguise herself as a page and go to Milan, Lucetta is a more grounded counterpoint to her excitement. Unlike Julia, Lucetta is not blinded by love and she has the clarity to have doubts about Proteus's reliability. In The Sims 2, Lucetta is a knowledge sim. I feel like the only aspiration that would not fit Shakespeare's Lucetta is romance, but anything else could work. We don't know enough about her to know precisely. It's kind of funny that Sims 2 Lucetta is married to Thurio, because in the play they don't even meet. Lucetta presumably stays in Verona when Julia goes to Milan, and Thurio lives in Milan, and there's no indication that he's ever been to Verona. But you could imagine that after Julia marries Proteus, she settles in Milan with him and asks Lucetta to join her, and that's where Lucetta and Thurio could meet and ultimately marry. In Two Gens, Thurio is the foolish competitor to Valentine for Sylvia's hand. 
He seems to like Sylvia well enough, but he knows fully well that she doesn't love him, and in the end that's at least part of the reason why he gives her up to Valentine, which has the merit of making sense. I mean, of course, marriage wasn't really about love most of the time in Shakespeare's days, so let's not lose sight of the social norms in that time and place, but you know, if Sylvia wasn't even interested in theory of status or money or whatever else, that union was never a good idea. Maybe that's because of my modern eyes, but I can't bring myself to dislike Theorio as much as the play seems to want the audience to dislike him. He's full of himself and supposed to be a coward, but when you put him next to Proteus, there's no comparison. <laughs> Theorio is definitely the more decent person there. In The Sims 2, Theorio is a family sim, which the play doesn't contradict, we don't really know. Shakespeare's Theorio comes off as more serious than playful and more grouchy than nice. He's not particularly shy. And that's basically all the indications we have. Theorio and Lucetta's last name is Brigella, which is another character of the Commedia dell'arte, like Pantalone. The Encyclopedia Britannica describes Brigella as a roguish, quick-witted, opportunistic, and sometimes lascivious and cruel figure. So a clever character who doesn't mind being dishonest to achieve his goals, a character whose loyalty can easily be bought. The Britannica adds, because of his almost sentimental view of love, though, the young lovers could trust him, so Brigella does have some respect for love. Again, I'm not sure if Maxis meant anything by giving Theorio and Lucetta this specific last name. In two gens, neither characters seem to be particularly roguish, opportunistic, lascivious or cruel, and Theorio is definitely not depicted as particularly smart. That's all the characters we needed to go over, but as a bonus, I have two names to give you if you're looking for more baby names for your Veronovel's next generation, Moises and Valerius. They are two of the outlaws who lurk outside Milan. We get no info on their personalities, but I thought those names were nice, and you might like them too. And that's it for The Two Gentlemen of Verona. This play was very similar to the one we looked at last time, but next episode is going to strike quite a different note. We are going to talk about Measure for Measure. That play is quite a lot. <laughs> that play is not really a comedy, and it's very striking in how relevant it is in its themes still today, which is actually very sad. It has some very complex and interesting characters, many of which are Veronaville residents. Claudio, Isabella, Vincentio, Francisca, Lucio, Overdone, Angelo, and Mariana. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for the next one. Of course, feel free to share your thoughts and theories on the sims we talked about in the comments and have a good rest of your day. And moyo, brisadine, ah, ah. rafe galas, ruba dubrig, ah, nice and moyo, ah. brisadine.